So we are interviewing Priscilla Soares, and uh, she is a Brazilian artist with many different talents. As I look around the room, I see all sorts of uh, paintings. I see uh, cartoon and kind of comic strip style artwork, as well as many different sculptures and uh, lots of interesting stuff to look at. Um, Priscilla, why don't you tell me a little bit about um, kind of from the beginning and let's kind of just get some backstory to, um, to kind of where you got to today. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Um, well, uh, when I was a child, I did um, learn how to do sculpture and painting from my grandmother. My paternal grandmother was, uh, she had a little studio in the back of her house and she would just do painting and do a little play sculptures in there. So she taught me how to work with those materials at first. And that was my very first fascination towards art that just kind of came from that. Um, and then as I grew older, um, I was 17 years old when my parents noticed that I was having a little bit of a hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So they took me to the doctor and the doctor told uh, us that I had a condition called cholestatoma, mm -hmm. which is a skin that grows in the, uh, in the middle ear and it starts corroding parts of your middle ear. So um, it corroded and it attacked my eardrum, so I had a perforation on my eardrum and I had to go and have surgery. Something went wrong in that surgery, so I ended up losing all the hearing on that ear. Mm. So after that, my path with my hearing loss started. Um, I had a dream of becoming um, a, an actress back then, and that kind of went out the window because a lot of fears started coming up. Uh, being afraid of being in public and being in front of people, I realized I had no idea where sounds were coming from. So um, with that, I became more and more shelled in. Um, I, a little bit after that, I went to college in Brazil for an art school. I wanted to try different materials there. And um, at art school, I spent two years in there. I got an associate's degree, but it was an art school that was more made for people who wanted to become art teachers in mean, like elementary school or middle school, high school. And that wasn't really what I was aiming for. I really just wanted to go and do a deep dive into art. But there was a motion picture class in there and I thought that was fascinating. I've always really enjoyed all kinds of art related stuff. So I had an opportunity to come to the US to go to college and I decided to do motion picture. And so I came here to California, to San Francisco, uh, to the Academy of Art, and I decided to do motion picture there. And while I was doing motion picture, I had some elective classes and I took some uh, fine art related classes. And that's when I realized that I really, really should have picked uh, fine arts instead yeah. because I was just so drawn to all going back to the clay and to the painting and to all those materials that I was doing when I was a child but it was way too too expensive to switch so I just decided to not do that instead but that was um so I finished the the, the motion picture course and um kind of stopped doing the art for a while you know the, the doing other things absolutely yeah so yeah so that's kind of how it all started yeah Very cool. yeah i think that's uh something that a lot of artists kind of you know they they decide on one on one path early on and then as they start to get a little taste of everything they start to realize oh geez maybe this isn't exactly you know the thing that i wanted to do to begin with but like you said sometimes it's just too expensive to switch and then we just got to take what we did for for what it is and kind of apply it to other other versions and other types of art that we we do um so that's you know i feel like that's a that's something that a lot of artists have experienced i myself including um right where did you what was sort of your first job after uh, college or your first related field job because I feel like a lot of us we know after yeah high school, yeah also. I did I did I did work as a as a nanny for a while because I had my first son when I was finishing college and when I was uh, still doing the motion picture school so I was working as a as that and some of the families that I worked for um, they knew I was very artistic so I uh, began playing with photography and they hired me to do their um, 
uh, greeting cards for Christmas and stuff. So what I would do is I would say I would take pictures of them and then I would bring it to Photoshop and do something completely magical and different with it. And they loved it. They got like a great kick out of it. So that became a little bit of a business for me. So I started taking pictures of different families and then I would just bring it to the computer on Photoshop and change some stuff, either make it funny or make it magical or whatever it was, you know, with some kind of message. And then I would print out the cards, you know, and then, you know, they would, they would just be really happy with that. And that started my little business in doing design. <laughs> from that, again, dabbling more and more into all the softwares, learning graphic design from doing it, and then going into web design as well. And then all of a sudden, I was just working with design. And it's like full time. Yeah. So mm. sort of uh, kind of pushed you into like a graphic, graphic design kind of career at that point. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, I feel like your story resonates with me quite a bit, because, <laughs> you know, you know what kind of art you want to do for a living, but it doesn't always end up being what you, what you do. Exactly. Uh, which is, it's, it's good to know that I'm not the only one, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think when you have a passion for so many different things in art, you know, it does become quite a, a journey to try to figure out which one is it that you really want to get into, and so you do you know, you do try out this one and then this one, and then you see which one is really going to like be the one that's going to get you fascinated. It took me a really long time to see that that wasn't really the search that I had to be doing. It wasn't about which direction. It was about something from within me. You know, what is it that I really want to express? What is it that's inside of me that I want to bring out there and then just play with any of those materials or all of them, even if you want to, all of those mediums to bring that message out there to people, you yeah, know, so definitely. that became the new journey. Yeah, Yeah. no, for sure. It's mm -hmm. uh, before we started this podcast, I was talking with Priscilla about how as an artist, you, some artists, not all of them feel like they want to play with a little bit of all types of mediums. And I think it's pretty apparent when I first saw your work here it was like oh this this resonates with me because I totally love sculpture I love messing with you know clay and and traditional you know mediums like that painting cartooning like whatever it may be yeah and uh yeah it's it's an interesting uh it's an interesting dilemma I think a lot of us face is yeah. trying to figure out <laughs> which one we're gonna go with and uh it's it's cool it's cool to see that um see that kind of resonating through the art community um Let's see. So um, I, I see that a lot of your messages in your art kind of pertain to your personal experiences in your life and stuff like that. Um, and I noticed um, one of the pieces that really struck to me was your self-portrait when I came in and um, kind of the messages. You have all these stories next to all of your paintings kind of explaining uh, the meanings behind some of them. And um, can you just kind of divulge a little bit into the different um, pieces that you have around the room and kind of explain? Just okay. so you don't have to do all of them, just, you know, some of the ones that kind of strike the most accord with you. Yeah, the, definitely these pieces have, a, they have a, a, definitely a personal theme to it. Uh, with my own like about my own experiences with my hearing loss and not just my hearing loss, but my youngest and I have two boys. Mm -hmm. um, my youngest one was born deaf. And um, I don't have anybody else in my family that has any history of hearing loss aside from myself. So when he was born, he did the hearing screening and he didn't pass. And they told me it could be fluids. You know, sometimes there's fluids in the ear so they don't pass it. And I'm like, oh, of course it's fluids, you know, it's just there's no history. This is not a genetic thing. It's not going to be deaf. You know, I'm the one with the hearing loss. And I had already dealt with... The, the hearing loss that started at age 17, but when I was 24, you know, I noticed that there was cholesteatoma on my other side, on my other ear. So when we, when we went to do a surgery to take it out, it had already corroded all the bones on my middle ear. So I had to start wearing hearing aids. So I was already wearing hearing aids when my son was born, um, the, my youngest one. So, um, well, there were fluids in his ears and we took it out and he was still with very, very little hearing, it's called profoundly deaf, which is pretty much, you know, legally deaf. Uh, so that became, became my, my new journey then was to try to help him out. And so I spent years and years and years on that journey of um, advocating for him 
And while I did that, I put him in a preschool for, with total communication um, program, which means doing sign language and um, doing oral speech. So they kind of cater to the kid's needs depending on the child. So I worked in there as an aide. I helped out with the children and I met other families and going through various different degrees of um, dealing with whatever it is that was coming up with their own children, which wasn't always just hearing loss. Actually, most of them had other issues that would come up uh, as well or some with their syndromes. And, you know, sometimes they were premature babies. So there was a lot going on with those uh, kids that I met. Um, and I started becoming really passionate about um, helping them out because I had already dealt with my own hearing loss for so many years and I felt prepared to help my son. But then when I realized it was actually deaf and I had to figure out if, whether or not I want to put a cochlear implant on him, which is you know, a, pretty, a pretty invasive surgery and it was a huge decision to have to be made, I found myself in a whole new area that I've never been to before. It was a lot harder for me to figure out what to do with that. And I'm sorry I'm giving you all this story, but I just no, really want to explain the background behind why I absolutely. did all these paintings, you right, know? Right. Um, what I didn't realize is that at, before my son was born, I was kind of putting my hearing loss under the rug. You know, I did not want to deal with the problems that came along with it. And I just, without noticing, only knowing now, that I really put myself in a very sheltered, safe environment. I would work from home, in front of my computer. I would just relate to people on a one-on-one, -on -one, in small groups. I would not really put myself out there so much because it was a lot more uncomfortable. And very, there, were, there were a lot of struggles with that, with being out there. So I had, without knowing, a fear of putting myself on the spotlight Therefore, I never picked my art because I knew if I did, I would have probably be called to do things like this podcast. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <And Yeah. That's laughs> so, it, not consciously, I started making a lot of decisions that were very safe and it put me in my little bubble and I was just there doing that until my son was born. When he was born, it wasn't about me, it was about him. So I had to roll up my sleeves and do something because when you have a hearing loss before you have any language, it's very different from what I experienced. I already knew language. I knew how to speak. I was able to communicate. He didn't have any of that. So somehow he would have to communicate, either be sign language or oral. He had to communicate somehow. He had to learn those things from scratch without being able to hear. So there was a lot of work to be done there. Um, so I, uh, while I was advocating for him, I started on a path of healing myself because I had to open up that Pandora box, you know, about hearing loss. And I was around so many experts, you know, the teachers, the specialists. There's so I was learning so much and I was so fascinated. I love to talk about the hearing and all the things that come with it and learn what's going on in people's lives, helping the other families, you know, and then getting to know all the kids. Um, so that became my, fashion, my, my new fascination. Up until two years ago, I was still not doing any art. That's when I realized um, that I was getting, slowly I was getting depressed because I was spending all these years, you know, I was catering to my children and I was just doing my design, which was not satisfying enough to me. I liked it, but it wasn't a passion. Um, and I wanted to get back into my art. I would look in my studio, see all those materials I had in there, and I just was feeling stuck. I did not know how to get out of that. And I was just not feeling very motivated and really, really upset. Um, so I actually decided that I was gonna do something. And I applied for a CrossFit class. That was my first step. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise always Exercise. Helps. And I it wasn't thinking, I'm like, I need to get moving and do something. So I put myself in a CrossFit class in Benicia and I would go every Thursday and, you know, start moving around. And I felt good. I felt so good that I decided I was going to then, you know, I'm going to start eating really healthy. So I changed my diet and I felt even better, you know. So I changed my diet I'm like... I'm going to start listening to really amazing and inspiring podcasts. And oh my goodness, when I did that, it was just like, <gasps> because I was hearing all those pep talks, you know, right. yep. <laughs> from yep. other artists, from, from, you know, important people. And, and, and it was so inspiring. 
And it really put something in my mind where I had to really, really think, what was it that I was doing with my life? Where did I really want to go? When was the day that it was going to be finally the day that I would say, all right, now I'm ready to get back to my art, you know, or really do something with it. You have all these dreams and you're not doing anything with that. Right. So I um, decided that I was going to do it and I was ready for it, you know, so I rolled up my sleeves again and I'm like, okay, I'm going to grab all this stuff and I'm going to start making something. But I had no idea direction. I didn't know. I just just knew I wanted to do something, you know, so like I want to start. So I started doing stuff and I would be totally focused on my art and my entire family began to fall apart. My kid, one, had a problem with behaviors that was really serious. <laughs> the other one was getting anxiety and depression at bedtime. And the other one got in trouble at school. You know, my husband started complaining that, uh, you know, I was doing all this art. And it takes time for you to actually earn an income out of anything that you, you know, build from the ground up. Definitely. And I was just so, like, I did the jump from design to art, like, boom, you know. So it's just really... There was nothing coming so yet. Um, so I had to stop. I had to stop again and I had to put myself and figure out what do I do? You know, this is, this is really hard. And I started doing therapy because I didn't know how to help myself anymore. Um, and with doing therapy and I started doing coaching and I started taking a class for a business uh, for artists and then I started slowly building the path again so these pieces are basically when I started doing the class I realized that um, I had to figure out how to put together what I was really passionate about with what I really knew how to do well you know and combining that into turning to my mission and so when I made a list of all the things that I was passionate about and all the things that I already knew how to do and the things that I was really good at, the the kind of things that people call you and say, hey, can you do this for me because you're really good at this? And then find what combines and then call it your sweet spot, you know? And my sweet spot had to do with hearing loss. It had to do with children. It had to do with clay and with painting and even photography. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to, you know, do something around all of this stuff then. And this is the beginning of a path. It was starting to form. So... I created a project called uh, The Weekly Letting Go. It was a project that came to me through a um, a meditation process that I did. And when I went, when I was in a meditation trying to figure out what I should do with myself, the message that I got was to trust and to let go. And I didn't really know what that meant. But when I told my therapist about it, she said, why don't you try this week to like maybe either do a journaling or a painting or whatever you want to do, you know, to kind of see what comes out with this trust and let go message that you just received. So I decided to do that. And when I did that, a painting came out of it with the sculpture, which is the one that's right behind you right there, uh, that's called Black Holes. Um, It came out kind of dark and kind of, strange to me and I, I but the idea was to really just do something without thinking without worrying about what the material was going to be um, without worrying how it's going to turn out you just just do it you know just let it out of you it was almost like vomiting it out so right. I just sat down and I just grabbed what I wanted in front of me that thing has been sitting in there forever that from that wooden piece and I just started sculpting on it and painting on it and using different materials and then I was done and I was like well that wasn't so bad you know I did I finished the piece you know you can do it and then I said okay I'm gonna do it again next week and then again the week after that and then I decided to film myself while doing it and to I was already knowing that I was having the fears of putting myself on the spot. So I decided to apply to the exercise that I should really start blogging (laughs) on this and start exposing all the work that I was doing, you know, and and videotaping what I was doing and showing it out there to really start getting used to being okay with just being out there. And with that, the pieces started popping up, you know, one week after another, I started like doing another one and another one. And some came out super interesting. Some came out, whatever. Sometimes I would write, sometimes I would do a little comic, 
you know, sometimes it would be something really elaborate that would take me almost every single day of that week. Sometimes I overlapped, you know, but it was okay because you just let go, let go of those barriers, the fears, the everything, just keep on doing. So the project served its purpose. It served its purpose, which was to get me out of that. I feel stuck. I don't know what to use. I don't know how to, you know, where to go and which direction and, or, and, or being out there, anything. I just was able to just really apply it and got me on the flow. So now, you know, the pieces kept on going and I know the, the mission now what, that I have to do with it. You know, right, it really right. showed. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. amazing. I mean, it's like it, it, having that, that escapism, you know, to be able to just freely express however you want, I think is kind of the, um, the core values of a lot of people for a lot of people for why they do art. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, some people have a motive behind it, but I feel like a lot of the, the I wouldn't want to say truer artists, but a lot of, you know, artists who are artists at a core mm-hmm. experience that, that same type of um, path and journey. You know, I've, I've always had issues with um, drawing or f- trying to finish sketchbooks and stuff because I always have a vision for how I want it to look in the yeah. end. So I tear out pages, mm-hmm. you know, and then I, then I just have like a million sketchbooks of torn out pages and nothing else in it yeah and uh it's you know i think that being able to allow yourself to be so freely open yeah. and to just create the art for yourself right i think do it anyways yeah, yeah there's something about that that i think is it's just very healthy and you know it, it's like it's like a form of therapy in its own i think mm-hmm. allowing your mind to just like you said, vomit onto just whatever canvas. Absolutely. It was absolutely a therapy experience. I really felt like I needed to get out of myself or within me all that stuff that's just being stuck for all these years, you know, that it needed to come out. I knew that I had a need in, within me to, to bring this to life but I haven't been doing anything about it. So it was all inside my head and it was in those little sketches and notes and stuff because... I, when I even came up with the name of what I was going to call it, I said, I'm going to call it my lucky years, you know, which is the years of being lucky and the lucky years. And so I wanted to play around with that idea. So when I came up with the name, I had, um, uh, uh, um, I, I started seeing uh, that the theme, I lost myself. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. That's fine. <laughs> it, you know, thinking at a thousand miles a minute. Yeah, I together. think I went too fast. I forgot what it was, why I started saying that in the beginning. Um, but I so. see it, you know, it makes, it, it, it shows in the artwork. And um, I think having that sort of progression of the growth of your, your artistic work and its personality, mm-hmm. I think it really shows in the pieces. And, you know, it just, it, it's, I think it speaks very loudly yes. you know and um and then i the other thing that fascinated me, me when i walked first saw your your gallery was all these especially this girl here on the wall um i started noticing all these very uh caricature like sculptures and i and i noticed a puppet and yeah <laughs> and it, made, it makes sense now because you were talking about how you uh originally went to school for cinema and, and yeah. stuff like that so I really see it you know it reminds me of claymation and and that kind of style where it's just absolutely you know. yeah I grew up uh, reading my parents collected graphic novels and comic books so I grew up reading those so I loved storytelling and when I did motion picture I've always had a fascination for stop motion so I do want to bring some of these characters to life and I won, I created some part of what you're seeing, the puppets and the dolls and stuff are really related to the children because I really wanted to be able to empower people with hearing loss or other disabilities. And uh, through my work, through my art, that was, that's part of my mission, you know, how I wanted to do that. So, but part of my work is more related to the children and part of them are a little bit more of my personal work, which is a little more adult oriented. So I had those two going on, but they're all related to the hearing loss world, you know, so wearing different devices or not wearing any device at all, because um, hearing loss is a very invisible uh, disability. You know, you can't walk by someone and know that they're, you know, if I put my, my device behind my devices, you're never going to know that I have hearing loss, right. mainly if we're talking one-on-one. If we're in a big group of people in the restaurant, maybe so, mm-hmm. but it would take time for you to realize that, you know, my hearing loss is there. So it can be quite invisible, 
And there is also a huge difference between being completely deaf and being hard of hearing. Because if you're completely deaf, you're part of the deaf world, there's a community in there for you. Right. You know, they're actually, they pride themselves in being, you know, a part of that community that, you know, communicates through sign language, which right. is amazing. Yeah. You know, so my son can be part of that community. I feel like when you have, when you're hard of hearing, you're kind of, you don't hear very good, so you have more than the mid, you know, hearing loss, you have a quite significant hearing loss, but you're not completely deaf. You're not quite ready to embrace the, the deaf world completely because you hear some, you know, you're able to communicate orally. Right. But at the same time, you don't have a normal hearing. So you're just like you're in the between, you know, so you struggle to adapt in, in hearing, you know, environments, but you also feel like you don't belong to in a deaf world environment. So you're like in between those things. So that personal struggle that I have is very different from what my son experienced. So there are many different experiences and I felt like all of those aspects had to be shown. So my art has a little bit of the humor, a little bit of the sadness, you know, the, the definitely the theme of coming out and, and, and putting yourself out there and showing up because that is the struggle. Like I want to share how I feel and I know people relate to it regardless of having a hearing loss or not, you know, because I think a lot of people have that struggle. Like I really want to put myself out there. I want to trust, you know, that I can do this, whatever it is that they're going through, but they can't quite do it. So all of those are showing in my work. What is it to feel like, you know, you have the strength. And then my first piece that I did that's related to hearing loss is the one that I'm jumping over the big ear right there, as I call it, conquering. And that one, for sure, it was me finally feeling like, yeah, I can do this, you know. Right. <laughs> I don't have no problem anymore with my own hearing, you know, whatever, if people see it. Because I was really scared because I, I up until then, because I was wearing hearing aids, but I had the potential of hearing a, of wearing a hearing device that was a lot better quality for my type of hearing loss, which is the bone anchored hearing aid, which is the one that I wear now. And I was like, I don't want to because it part of it was <laughs> you have to basically have two screws on attached to the skull in your head. Right. And that freaked me out. But then after having my son, it, everything changed because all of a sudden, you know, I, he ended up getting the cochlear implants and that's a much more invasive surgery, much more serious. So if I was okay for him to do that, you know, if that I was, you know, all right, you can go ahead and do it. I guess I'm okay with you doing that. So shame on me for not doing it, you know, a little screw on your own self, which is really a much more minor surgery pro right. procedure to go through. So I went ahead and did that. But it's a very, very unusual type of hearing device. You know, people really don't know much about it. So that's why I did the self-portrait uh, right. that you see in there where it shows the screw, which that one people don't usually see it unless I take my device off. Because you know, my dev device, people think it might be a, a Bluetooth device. I don't know. A lot of people think. <laughs> I can see that. People don't even ask me about it, right. you know, which I find it so fascinating. I thought that I was going to be stopped on places like, what is that? You know, and people quite just didn't really ask even if I put my hair up like this they don't care but um the screw is something that you're really not gonna see you know unless you're like you know in my house with me and right. all that because I have to take them off and I won't hear right so it was it was almost like a very intimate thing about you so and when I did that painting it was like I was really exposing myself and it was so interesting because I posted it on three different Baja users, this is short for bone anchored hearing aid, Baja users, you know, uh, on, on Facebook. And I got a huge response from that really nice one, you know, cause it was like, wow, you know, you did that. That's really cool to like show, you know, something that Be people, so open. yeah. And just sharing for everyone to see, you know, including like my friends and family, they don't usually see my screw, you know? So right. it was like, wow, that was really, really brave of you to put that out there, you know, in a self portrait and show your abutment. Did it, did it give you a sense of validation for your artworks mission? And kind of just being an artist as a whole, like just knowing that, you know, you were so afraid to do it at first. And then once you just put it out there, like the response was so great. Absolutely. It wasn't so much like I had a fear of showing my abutment because I was already past the fear of, of have wearing weird devices that, you know, that were so different. Right. You know, because, I mean, people sometimes, I mean, a lot of people are afraid of just wearing regular hearing aids. Which is so weird to me because like glasses is fine, you know, we're way past the years where glasses was just a weirdo thing, you know, but, but, but hearing aids is like, no, you don't want people to see it. You want it to hide. So, and, and what kind of message is that for the children, you know, for, 
a kid like my son and his friends, you know, when you're trying to say, oh, you should, you know, get something to hide. You're hiding your disability. You're hiding the things that are part of who you are. So that's part of why I really wanted to change that with my art. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, and that painting particularly struck an accord with me when I walked in because, I mean, I didn't, it didn't uh, occur to me that that's what your sort of artistic um, uh, embodiment was sort of about was, you know, the hearing loss. But as I started to walk around and starting to look more, you know, deeply into these, I, I noticed that a lot of the art has inspiration of uh, children who have this other types of disabilities. And then I started to look closely and I started to sort of piece it together. I started to see the ears. Yeah. And then I came to this last piece on the wall and I was like, oh, now, now I get it. It makes Hi, so much sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even the puppet, his, his devices are not on him right now because I'm finishing it up, but he's inspired on my son. My son also was diagnosed with ADHD, and the puppet is perfect for that because puppets don't stop moving. You know, you right. barely touch it, and they do all the... And that's exactly like how he is. So he's going to have little wings on the legs and the arms, that's and awesome. he's going to have his glasses because all my son has glasses, so i got to put glasses on him too to that's match. Great. But yeah, so... Uh, so that was why I did that. So I am doing a, a, a work that's related to um, commissioned work that's related to individual cases um, of some people that have different types of hearing loss. You know, so I'm doing the work that you, you saw me doing in there. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if you saw me talking about it, but it's about this little boy that um, wears cochlear implants, but he also has a cerebral palsy. And uh, so he is on a wheelchair, um, but he's learning how to walk now. But um, I interviewed his mom and I talked to her and she's and I asked her, you know, who do you think she's going to be when he grows up? And she said, oh, um, um, I know this sounds a little silly, she said, but I think he's going to be whoever he wants to be, you know. And I thought about that very deeply and I said, you know what, that's very interesting. I think he inspires me to do something. And I thought about the Dr. Seuss books, All the Places You Go, which I love. Yeah. And so magical. And I remember that they has that page with the scene that has the, the them all going with the balloons and like, oh, you'll go far, right. you know, you'll go yeah. places. So I had this image of him getting out of his wheelchair, you know, and flying places. You know, you might not be able to walk, you know, but you'll definitely fly. You'll fly places. So I started sculpting this piece based on him, you know, to inspire that idea. So it that's just great. empowers who the person who he is and who he's going to become. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, yeah, I love, I just love the whole concept behind yeah, your your sort of direction now that you're moving with with you know this customized artwork and uh, artwork with a clear story. You know, some artwork you look at it and it's paint splatters and you decipher yes. what you want from it. But this is like very concrete. You know, it's, very. It's very concrete, <laughs> and I love that. It's sometimes I don't like to guess too much, uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, I I think that's that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, thanks for kind of sharing the whole insight of of everything i mean I, it's it was something that i really wanted to hear after seeing your work and just kind of um i had so many questions and i think you answered a lot of them thank you um i also put my business card into your um your little you had a little vase yes. out on the table and uh it was it was for a sort of tutorial on how to do something called cor- cold porcelain yes can you explain to me what that is because after seeing it i didn't quite get it I thought a lot of your pieces were fired ceramic pieces no but then after I saw that I kind of realized that you're working in something that I'm not familiar with I, I do have some experience with like super sculpy and okay you know some of those other types of clays that you have to bake and fire I mean you can let them dry out but yeah you should just have to bake and fire yes. what is cor- cold porcelain and, and cold porcelain yeah that that is so interesting that most Americans have no idea what it's uh what it is uh, it was first originally created in argentina and it was made mostly for creating flower realistic looking flower pieces you know like out of this clay uh, because you can make it really thin and it kind of gets a little bit translucent because it's uh, basically made out of glue and cornstarch okay so it's glue cornstarch and a few other little ingredients like a uh, lemon extract or white vinegar water mm-hmm. and um, baby oil which is mineral oil baby oil so you can get baby oil and use that and anyway so you have those um those ingredients and um it air dries mm-hmm. 
and you can mix it with acrylic paint or oil paint uh, so you make the colors with it and it's a really fun clay to play with and it's fairly inexpensive um there are just air dries it just air dries that's crazy yeah i know and it has a look and a feel that's a lot like sculpey that's why you probably thought that because right. yeah. it has a lot a lot of that though i mean the difference though is because because it's made out of glue and has a lot of water in it it does shrink about 15 percent oh wow so that's quite a bit so i work a lot in layers that's why you see like the sculpture that you're seeing in here i first do the first layer i let it dry a little bit and then i start bringing i do first the, the basic uh, of the shape and so i have the pose down and then I bring the bone structures and then I'll bring the, the, the muscles and then I'll bring the skin. Um, so then it's more realistic, like I did on my, you know, out of the cochlear shell piece that she's really was, was brought up from the bone to the outer skin. Right. So you can really do that. It's like, which is um, in the Sculpey, you do a little bit differently. You can actually just do the whole thing yeah. or any, any other clay really. Right. But if you do that, you're going to deal with a lot of shrinkage. So then all of a sudden you're doing like a hand on a certain size and then it's going to be 15% smaller. So you got to <laughs> think about calculate prior and then <laughs> a 15% bigger because you know it's going to go a little down. So. so building up is a easier way to kind of make sure I think that it's, so. that it's uh, yeah. kind of consistent the whole way through. Oh yeah. Even like when you're doing the nose, you know, you do it and you let it dry and you're like, oh, the nose is a little too small. So you keep adding, you know, right, a little right. bit to it. But it's cool because you can also mix it with just water. You just dab your finger on you know on, on a little bit of water and then it just blends with so it adds very easily if there is a crack you can fix it you can sand it you can paint all on it you mm -hmm. know just fine uh, it's really it's it's really um um there are many ways that versatile yeah very versatile yeah wow. so you can do whatever really with it yeah that's, that's really cool yeah I, was, <clears throat> I think i was thinking there was some sort of um definitely some sort of uh what's the, the term i'm looking for because I had never heard it, I was like, okay, this has got to be like something that is definitely not like common here, you know, no, in America. No, it's not. Yeah, it's very common in Brazil with the crafters. They make uh, cake toppers, like personalized sculptures, right. you know, like with that clay so they can keep it forever afterwards. So it's not edible, you know, you right. just keep it with you. And it's, it's, it's like a fever, you know, they all right. do it and all the crafters love to do that. That's kind of how I started playing with it. I That's was right. doing little sculptures for cake toppers and at home. And I took some classes online with a Brazilian woman that was really good at making. And I learned how to make Beyonce with her. <laughs> I'm like, I don't really want to make a sculpture of Beyonce, but I'll do Beyonce. Cool. So I, yeah, which is really cool. Yeah, it was really cool at the end. But I learned so much. And like, how did she get the clay to look that way? Right. And even the actual recipe for the clay took me a while to, because there are many different little variations in two weeks of how much glue, how much uh, cornstarch, how much mm -hmm. water you use, and all the other stuff that goes with it. They switch it up a little bit. So I would try and try and try, and every time my clay was too soft, it would just have those little kind of like start melting yeah, a little bit. I'm right. like, what's going on with my clay? You know. Yeah. So it took me some time to learn the recipe that really, really worked. Because in Brazil, it's so common that they just buy it ready to go. Oh, so it's actually sold in stores and yeah, stuff like now that. Yeah, now it is. So yeah. it's so easy. But I'm in the U.S. Nobody knows about it. And I want to make my own clay, you know. So yeah. it's exciting. It's that's glue and cornstarch, cool. you know. That's so cool. Not much to it. You just put it in the microwave. Yeah, Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, <laughs> the, well, I think the closest thing we have right now is like paper clay. Yeah, you very know, similar. Yes. kind of like the closest thing, but... Mm -hmm. It's definitely different. Like the way it looks when it's finished is is completely. It it looks so much. I mean, I guess porc like porcelain because mm -hmm. the whiteness and the smooth, the, yeah. the ability to smooth it out so much. Yeah, and if you don't paint on it, I mean, this guy here you can see he's not painting on, so he's a little bit translucent when it's uh, even though there's color. When you paint on it, it does have a little bit of a different feel depending on the paint right. that you I use on that. it. Yeah. So yeah, like the, this one with the girl and all the hanging. Um, papers and stuff she was not painted yeah she wasn't painted no wow that's no. crazy she was just the clay in there because that, that was a very early piece i wasn't doing the painting that was before i took my beyonce class right <laughs> so <laughs> you were learning so, on your own. yeah yeah so she was one of my i was playing a lot with it i really was excited about the clay but it was no painting going on in that one it was just mixing the colors straight on the clay 
and then using that you yeah know, it, so. it, are you using like dyes or regular like acrylic paints how do you what are you using to mix just regular cheapo acrylic paints gotcha. you know so that you get that in the craft pigment. store yeah so it's yeah. Just, you really don't have to go expensive or crazy with it and you can put a like a matte finish spray varnish if you want afterwards so it's more durable that's fine too a lot of them do that you can also scrub it under water before you paint on it so you get some of the markings out because right. you're playing you you're rubbing so much on it with water and stuff and sometimes it gets a little smudged on it so if you scrub it with a toothbrush under the water because the water kind of melts it a little bit right. you know right but Just, not like not like full-on melting. no but. no it doesn't destroy it i mean if you want to put it somewhere that there is water and stuff you're definitely gonna have to put something to protect it right. some kind of varnish or i don't know because how you, fragile is it oh well it's glue so right. it's just as strong as if you a glob of glue yeah. you know it's pretty i mean it, it, it's a little fragile and it's, you know if i wanted to just crack it i probably could a thin right. piece you right. know but uh but it's not so fragile that it crumbles or anything no like no other. yeah it's i know not, so you can pick it up pretty yeah and put it down yeah it, i've been worry. yeah i can hold it and move it around and be okay with that and not feel like i have to be super delicate about it but right. then, no the thin pieces definitely if i just turn it it will crack yeah, yeah. just like many other forms of clay actually. yeah but it's it's just interesting to me because I, I it's just weird that we never no one really explores that medium around yeah. here you know it's it's pretty cool to see that there's another form of clay that i've never even known yeah about, you know i played with fimo and all sorts of stuff with my my aunt who's a uh, just kind of a working artist and mm. you know she had a little studio and i was young she'd bring me over and we'd be doing little fimo animals and yeah. whatever but yeah, I thought it all clay had to be baked, you know, yeah. or fired or whatever Something. it may be. Yeah, so that's really cool. It's uh, it's and that um, if people wanted, if people listening wanted to get that recipe from you, can they? Um, you have it available on your website. Do you I, have do. It? You I do. I decided to give out the recipe your on my website. Recipe. Yes, my secret <laughs> recipe, the one that works with all the hints on yeah. what what can come up when you. Right. When you're working on it, yes, you can go on my website. Uh, it's uh, myluckyyears.com. So okay. that's um, uh, L U C K Y E A R S dot com. Okay, yes. Great. Yeah, I'll definitely mm -hmm. leave, a, leave a little link in the descriptions there for everybody to check that out. Um, awesome. Yeah, and let's see what else do we have here on the agenda. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's covered a majority of everything that I want to kind of get out of you and you know it's really interesting to to see all these pieces together and kind of learned how you kind of came to be in your in your journey to where you're at now and i really you know i appreciate you taking the time to come out here and you know meet with me and have me have me interview you it's it's been a pleasure thank you lucas i really appreciate that you're calling me and um, getting me to do this interview with you it's been really fun yeah, so um, hopefully we'll, 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 this won't be the end and we'll, we'll keep in touch and see each other again in the future. Sounds awesome. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in the next one.